Uh, please turn with me to our scripture reading this morning from 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9, that's page 312 if you're following in the Pew Bible. And David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called him to appear before David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba, your servant? He replied. The king asked, is there no one still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? And Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. And Ziba answered, he is at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table, and he was crippled in both feet. As I was asking the uh, children what the most important item of furniture is in your home, it's a good one for us to think about as well. What would you miss the most? Probably your bed, if you didn't have it. Uh, yes, a fridge is a good one. Uh, but I hope that some of us at least thought about a table. Tables are important. Uh, tables are more important than TVs. I hope you would agree. In our morning series called Home, um, what we're going to do each of those Sundays is to have an item of furniture on the platform just to remind us of that aspect of home. And I thought, I don't need to bring a table because we already have a table at the front of the church. And this is the table. When I was in Scotland uh, at the Easter break, uh, we visited Dunblane Cathedral. Dunblane's where Andy Murray comes from. Didn't see him that day. But we went to the cathedral, and if you've been into Dunblane Cathedral, it's a bit like uh, an Anglican church, one of those older churches, that sort of shape. It has at the front, uh, I think it's called an apse, um, a, a big area uh, with a raised dais, and on that was the communion table. And I got chatting to one of the guides who was a member of the congregation and I was just asking him about the church. It's a cathedral with long history. It goes way, way back, way back to, to, to pre-Reformation times. And he was saying there came a point in the history where it became, it was no longer an Anglican church, it became a Presbyterian church. And he says, I have to keep explaining to the people that the table at the very front of the church on that raised dais is not an altar. It's a table. And he says, in fact, at communion, what we do is we, we wheel it down. It has wheels on it, and we wheel it down to the front, in, in closer to the congregation when we have communion, because it's a table. And it is a table. It's a table that we remember the, the death of Jesus upon as we eat and as we drink. 
and it's a table. I made the point to the boys and girls that so much of Jesus' teaching was given at or around tables. Hospitality was a huge thing in the Middle East and still is. And hospitality is important to us as well, I, I would hope. Uh, last year, I tried an experiment uh, which was to encourage you to either be a host or to be hosted at someone else's table in the congregation. And that went very well, and there were quite a number of people who enjoyed that experience. And I, and I said there was only one rule, which was you would invite someone that you maybe didn't know that well. And you got to know them, and it went down very well, and people said, when are we going to do it again? Well, it's going to happen now. We're going to, we're going to do it again. We're going to do it at the end of this month. And I'm not going to do it the way I did last time, where I put a sheet out, and then people wrote down their names, those who wanted to host, those who wanted to be hosted, and then I, I matched you up, because I'm not quite sure who, who knows who now. I'm not quite sure who has been to dinner with so-and-so. So I'm just putting the invitation out to you yourselves. If you would like to invite someone from the congregation for dinner, then do it on either the 21st of May or the 28th of May. Okay, so that's just leaving it out there. If you would like to get to know someone better in the congregation that you maybe sit near or beside or you know them by name, maybe don't know them at all, invite them for lunch, for Sunday lunch, either the 21st or the 28th of May, okay? And if you are invited, hopefully you will agree to go. Maybe that Sunday won't sit, uh, try another one. But I believe that that very act in doing that, it, it binds the fellowship together. It makes us more like a home. We are brothers and sisters together. So it's either 21st or the 28th of May uh, to do that. And hopefully I'll hear reports back uh, of those who have done that. Table fellowship symbolizes welcome and acceptance. It symbolizes celebration and fun. It symbolizes covenant and loyalty, nourishment and blessing. And as we read that story in 2 Samuel chapter 9 of David and Mephibosheth, it has much to teach us about the table. Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan and the grandson of Saul. And that's important because Saul was part of the old regime. Saul was, well, saw David as an enemy. The old regime was gone. And in those very bloodthirsty days, often what happened in the Old Testament days was when a new king came on board, he made sure that the old regime was purged, got rid of, and sometimes even killed. And so Jonathan, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, fled, not knowing what David was going to do. Was David going to purge everyone, kill everyone? And so he became a recluse, and he escaped. And we find that David now wants to get and find Mephibosheth and bring him to him. And that may be what's behind 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 9, where David says to him, Mephibosheth, don't be afraid. He could have been trembling. He's coming before the king. Perhaps this is his end. Perhaps David is going to kill him. Perhaps David is going to get rid of him. And David says, Mephibosheth, don't be afraid. There's nothing, nothing to worry about. And it was because of the covenant that David had made earlier with Mephibosheth's father, Jonathan. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, Jonathan said to David, this was before uh, Jonathan and David had to separate because of Saul's threat on David's life. And Jonathan says to David in 1 Samuel 20, do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. So when David had Mephibosheth in front of him, he did not treat him as an enemy of the old regime. He treated him as a friend because of covenant, 
because of the promise that he had made to Jonathan. A, a covenant that was so close. They had a love for each other that was so close. And David felt that he could not break that covenant. And so he brought Mephibosheth in to show him favor. And in 2 Samuel 9 and verse 7, this is what he says to Mephibosheth. For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul. And you will always eat at my table. So Mephibosheth went from being a recluse, a refugee, hiding from the new regime, to being given a large estate with 30, 37 of a staff at his beck and call and to sit at the king's table. David insisted, verse 11, eat at the king's table like one of the king's sons. In other words, Mephibosheth enjoyed all the privileges of being treated as the king's son. He was entitled to the protection of the king. I can imagine some people were very envious of Mephibosheth. Maybe they, they might even want to kill him. Psalm 23 and verse 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. How true that was of Mephibosheth. And of course, there are obvious parallels for us in this story. Once we were enemies of God, Ephesians 2 and 13 says, You who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Romans 5 and verse 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, while we were yet enemies of God, while we were yet living under the regime of the evil one and following his orders, Christ died for us. David welcomed Mephibosheth because of a covenant with Jonathan, and God welcomes us today because of a covenant through Jesus. Jesus, as he came to that Passover meal and instituted this sacrament, he lifted the cup and said, this blood, it is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We can eat and drink at this table today because of a greater covenant than the one that Jonathan and David had, the covenant that Jesus cut for us in his own body on the tree. We belong to a rival regime. We were sons and daughters of the evil one. He called us back home. And whether you're an older son or a younger son, in the story of the prodigal that we looked at last week, we're called home. Welcome home. Welcome to the table. And at that table, David offered Mephibosheth protection and provision and position. And at this table, we're offered those same things, protection, provision, and position. We're offered the protection of Jesus. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. We need not fear the evil one because God's Spirit is in us. No harm will befall us unless God allows it. We are under his protection. And Mephibosheth was under the protection of David, King David, and we are under the protection of King Jesus. There is provision at David's table. There is provision here. It's a small meal of bread and wine, but it speaks of our faith being strengthened. It speaks of our soul being nourished and nurtured. There is real provision here for those who in faith eat and drink. There's protection, there's provision that will help us to live our lives in faith as we go from this place. But there's also position. At the end of verse 11, it says, so Mephibosheth ate at the king's table like one of his sons. After the throne, the king's table was the most important item of furniture. It wasn't everybody could eat at the king's table. His family, his chief officers, they could only eat at this table. His sons could eat at his table, but nobody else. There was position. 
And today we eat at this table because of our position in Christ. We are sons and daughters of the King. And it's not everybody can eat at this table, but you can today because of your position, because you have received Jesus Christ into your life as Lord and Savior. And so you can come to the table. And that's a great privilege. A great privilege. Yes, the elders will physically sit at the table, but in a sense, we're all around the table. The table's not big enough for us all to sit at it, but you, in your mind, you're at the table. And the last little thing in this story is a couple of times it mentions that Mephibosheth was lame. He was a cripple in both feet. Maybe he, maybe he needed to be carried to the table. Maybe today you need to be carried to the table. Maybe you feel today that you're not worthy to be at the table. But you're a son and a daughter of the living King. We're all lame. We've all got sin. We've all got something in us. We're not perfect. This table is for sinners. Now, that does not mean that as we eat and drink at this table, we go out and it encourages us to sin more. Paul says, no, by no means. No, the privilege of eating at this table means that we should be going to sin less because we go from that position of being a son or a daughter of the king. And it's a privilege to be here. In the parable of the great feast, the great banquet was prepared, and Jesus said in his story uh, that the master said to his servants, go and invite people to the banquet. And they said, no, I'm too busy. They were too distracted, too busy to come to the banquet. And so he says, okay, go to the street corners and invite to the banquet the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And that's us. The poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. We don't pay to be here. No, we come here because we recognize we're lame. And we cannot save ourselves. And we cannot earn our place at the table. No, we're here because we're lame. We have protection, we have provision, we have position because of what Jesus has done for us. And that's why we come to the table. And that's why we delight to be at the King's table. And this morning, there is no better place to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this table. We thank you that it's a table for all of us here, whatever age, whatever our infirmity, whatever our disability. We thank you that Jesus died for such as us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we rejoice today for the privilege of being here. We thank you that we can say we are sons and daughters of the King. And this meal is for us and Jesus is for us. We bless and thank you for all that this means. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.